Hello everybody and welcome to Blunt Mansion. My name is Mr. Michael and I'll be taking you on your field trip today. We decided to do a virtual field trip of Blunt Mansion because during the coronavirus isolation period none of us can leave our houses and you can't go to school and quite frankly your moms and dads are probably going a little bit crazy trying to find things for you to do to make sure that you don't fall behind on your schoolwork. So we thought it would be great if we could bring you to Blunt Mansion virtually until you get a chance to come here yourselves. Now, Blunt Mansion is a very special place. It's the only national historic landmark in Knox County. That means it's a place that is significant to the history of our entire nation, not just Knoxville and Knox County. William Blunt had this house built starting in 1792. George Washington, our nation's first president, appointed William Blunt to be the territorial governor. The Southwest Territory is the land that eventually became the state that we know as Tennessee, and William Blunt was key in making that happen. Now, when Blunt got this job, he was a aristocrat, really, a, a really big deal guy in North Carolina, a businessman, a politician, and he had signed the U.S. Constitution for North Carolina. Now, that's a really, really big deal. Only 39 men signed the U.S. Constitution, and there are only about a dozen or so houses that you can visit anywhere in the country that are, were houses of a U.S. Constitution signer, and Blunt Mansion is one of those. That puts us in league with places like Mount Vernon, or James Madison's house in Virginia, or Alexander Hamilton's house in New York. So this is a really special house right here in Knoxville. Now, when William Blunt got this job, his wife, Mary, was not too thrilled about coming to the Southwest Territory. Back then, Tennessee was kind of a wild place. It was the frontier, and Mary did not want to move here. She made William promise her that he would build her a nice house if she agreed to come here to the Southwest Territory. So this is the house that William Blunt built for his wife, Mary. It was also his capital, where he governed the Southwest Territory, and of course, their home. And if you can see those two gray pipes that run down the sides there, those are the gutters on either side of the main house. That's as wide as Blunt Mansion used to be. And then the wings, or the parts that are on the sides, were added in the next few years by Blunt and other people who lived here. Let me show you a few more things outside before we go inside Blunt Mansion. In addition to the special place that it holds in our nation's history and in Knoxville's history, Blunt Mansion is also really important because it has the only public garden in downtown Knoxville. And you can see there's some beautiful tulips blooming here right now. This garden has been taken care of by volunteers from the Knoxville Garden Club since 1934. So that's more than 85 years that these ladies have volunteered to make sure that we have this wonderful garden here that you can enjoy anytime we're open here in downtown Knoxville. So in addition to being a National Historic Landmark, Blunt Mansion is also a wonderful garden. Now here's something cool that you need to know about in the front yard of Blunt Mansion. What do you notice here? Lots of windows, right? And they don't seem that different than the windows in our houses today. But when Blunt Mansion was built, starting in 1792, this was the only house anywhere around here that had plate glass windows. Most people lived in log cabins or wooden stockades, kind of rough, uncomfortable places that didn't have beautiful windows like this. And when William Blunt had this house built, he had to have the glass for these windows brought here from other places, from North Carolina or Virginia. So this was really special, and because nobody had really seen this kind of thing around here, the legend is that Native Americans in this area referred to Blunt Mansion as the house with many eyes. And when you look at it, can you kind of see how the windows of a house look like its eyes? Now think about how many things these eyes, these windows, have seen over more than 200 years in downtown Knoxville. A lot of things have happened here, and things have really changed around Blunt Mansion since it was first started in 1792. Let's go inside. So here we are in the main room at Blunt Mansion. It's set up kind of like a dining room in our houses today. And as you can see, there's a fancy table set, but the dishes are a little bit different than what we have in our homes today. For starters, people used to drink out of these pewter cups. Now they're very pretty, but the reason we don't drink out of pewter anymore is this could give you lead poisoning. So just one of many things that's changed in 200 years in the way we live our lives. Now, this room used to be two rooms. Back when Blunt Mansion was a lot smaller, people would do their private things like sleeping and hanging out with their families on one side of the house, and the other room on the other side of the house was the public room where you would entertain. That all changed maybe 10 or 20 years after Blunt Mansion was built, and this became kind of like, again, a dining room in our homes today. You can see there's a fireplace here, 
But as we come in close to look at it, you notice how there were bricks on the inside of the fireplace? We have brick fireplaces today, but what makes these bricks different is we believe they were made on site by enslaved African American people right here in what is today Knoxville. But because these bricks were not superheated when they were made, when they were baked, you had to have this iron piece of metal here in the back called a fire back, and that reflected the heat back in the room and also kept the bricks from cracking when it was super hot. And you can see there's some other things here in front of the fireplace that were used to keep food warm during a dinner. Can you imagine how hard it would be to keep food warm without a microwave or even a modern oven or stove? We'll talk about that in just a minute when we go in the kitchen. Some other things to notice in this room are over here on the hunt table. This is a table where you could put prepared foods right before you serve them to your guests on the main table, but one of the most interesting things here is this cone of sugar. Sugar was actually very valuable in the 18th century when William Blunt and his family lived here. It would come wrapped in this special blue paper to keep it preserved and keep insects away from it, and it was hard, and you would snip off a little piece of it and put it in your tea or in your food. There's one more thing that I want you to notice in this room before we go to the next part of the house. Do you see how the walls here are covered in individual boards? It's kind of a rough finish, sort of like the inside of a barn. This is because that's what they had to work with in the early days. When we go into the next room, you'll be able to see a fancier kind of wall that people added when Knoxville was a little bit older and there were more resources here, more things that people could use to build houses. Now we're walking into a room that we call the East Wing here at Blunt Mansion. It's a lot fancier than that main room, and you can tell that by looking at the walls. Do you see how they're smooth, just like modern walls, and you don't see those individual boards that go up and down anymore? This room has been plastered. That means the people that finished this room added a plaster finish to smooth out the walls. This happened about 10 or 20 years after Blunt Mansion was first built, and you can see that the, the town had more resources, people had more money to spend, and this was a room that was designed to show guests that this is a fancy house, a very special place. Now this green table that we have here in the middle of the room, this is the place where you can, if you come and visit us here at Blunt Mansion in person, once we're able to open up to visitors again, you'll be able to write with a quill pen. And you can see how they would take a feather and make a pen out of it with a sharp tip. You would dip that into ink, and then you could write with a quill pen. Now there are a lot of really interesting things in this room, but one of the most important pieces of furniture is this desk. It was called a secretary, and this is the kind of desk that important people like William Blunt or wealthy merchants or judges or lawyers would use to, to do their writing and do their work. And there's a really cool secret in this desk. I'm going to show you now. Inside this drawer is a hidden compartment. There's a secret compartment in the back. You lift this up and it slides out. And here's a secret tray where you could put important documents that you don't want anybody to find. Slide it back in, close that, looks like a normal drawer, and your secret is safe. Now we've stepped into another part of Blunt Mansion. We call this the West Wing because it's on the west side of the house. And the people who've studied this building, the experts think this was actually a separate building that was just drug up and attached to the side of Blunt Mansion. But the really cool thing in this room is right over here. Check this out. These are actually William Blunt's shoe buckles, his actual shoe buckles that he wore when he was alive. They're pretty fancy, but these are not diamonds. These stones on the outside of the buckles were actually made out of paste. Can you imagine wearing something this fancy on your shoes? Now we've moved into one of the upstairs bedrooms at Blunt Mansion. And this is a place that would have changed a lot as Blunt Mansion changed in its early years. This used to be just a sleeping loft, and then they enlarged it into a full room. And one of the interesting things about this room, one of the things that people really enjoy seeing, is this bench. This is a bench where you can put your baby right here inside this wall, and the mom could use her foot to rock the baby while she was working or sewing or doing something else. And when the baby was older and you didn't need this little wall to keep them safe anymore, you could just lift it out. And now it's a regular bench where an older child can sit. A pretty ingenious artifact from our past. Now things were really different for children who grew up here in Blunt Mansion in the 18th century. If you were a child here, you wouldn't have gone to school at a school building. Your mom would have taught you in the house. And you wouldn't have had a tablet or a computer or a Chromebook to learn on. 
you would have learned how to write on a slate tablet like this. It's like an old-fashioned chalkboard. And you can see someone's written on this one a quote from Poor Richard. Do you know who that was? Poor Richard was actually Benjamin Franklin, another one of our founding fathers. He said, well done is better than well said. In other words, do the right thing, don't just say the right thing. Here in the other bedroom upstairs in Blunt Mansion is a great example of what beds used to be like. Now check it out. There's not really a mattress like what we have today. You're actually sleeping on a rope bed. And these ropes were tied between the sides of the bed. As you laid on them at night, they would start to loosen up and you'd have to tighten them every day with this wooden key. You turn it and actually tighten the bed. So that's where the phrase sleep tight comes from because you had to tighten your bed. And the mattress that you laid on top was frequently full of just moss or other things from your yard that you would use to put inside and that often had bugs in it. So that's where we get the saying, don't let the bed bugs bite. So once again, sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. Also in this room we have examples of the spinning wheels and the other machines that usually women or enslaved women and families like the Blunt family would use to make everything that they needed to wear or sleep on. And this particular machine is called the weasel. You've heard of it, even though you don't realize it. You would spin this around, and roughly every 99 to 100 turns, you got exactly the amount of yarn that you needed to make a skein of yarn, or a measurement of yarn to make things with. When you reach that final turn, this wooden part would pop out. And that's why we have the song, Pop Goes the Weasel. Now we're gonna leave the main house and go into a separate building. And this is the kitchen. Now the reason that kitchens were not inside the house back in the 1800s and 1700s is because there was always a fire in the kitchen in the days before microwaves and electricity. So there was always a danger that that fire might get out of control and it, it happened often and houses would catch on fire. So to keep people safe, the house and the kitchen were separated. Let me show you the Blunt's kitchen. Well, as I mentioned outside, all the cooking in the 1700s had to be done over fire. So the enslaved people who lived in Blunt households, specifically Sal, an enslaved woman, and we know her name because of research that historians did a few years ago, we know that she had to keep a fire going 24 hours a day. It would take hours to get the fire big enough to do what you needed to do to cook the food. And it was so hard to get it going that they just kept it going all the time. And also it was hard to make sure that all the food got warm at the right time and stayed warm. You'd have to start cooking some things earlier than others and still keep it all warm. The cooking took place over the fire. And you can see here we have this arm that swings out so you can control just exactly how close the food inside the, the pot here is to the flames. You could also put food on a rotating uh, grill like this. Looks a lot like grills you might have seen at a barbecue and you could put fish, because they didn't have cheeseburgers back then, but you could grill meat over it. And there were big pots or Dutch ovens where you could put food inside and bake it inside that oven. It gives us an appreciation of just how hard the people worked to prepare the food and how smart and good they were at what they did to make it work. If you and your classmates come see us for a field trip here at Blunt Mansion when school is back in session, you might actually get to see food cooked over an open fire. This kitchen was rebuilt on the spot where the original kitchen was. We would never have a fire in an actual 18th century kitchen, but because this one is rebuilt, we can. And it's really exciting that we can cook for you sometimes when you come. There's some other cool things in here to show you. This is not, well actually, let me just ask you, what do you think this is? Can you see it? It's made out of metal. Some students on field trips in the past have guessed that it might be a napkin holder. My favorite answer was maybe it's a taco maker, but this is actually a toaster. You put the bread inside and hold it over the fire and you can toast your bread by hand. That's one of the artifacts we have here in the kitchen. This is a candle mold. You would collect the grease from your meat, pour it into these, uh, into these molds, and the tallow would turn into candles. And they probably sputtered a little bit and smelled kind of bad when they burned, but that's how most people would make candles back in the 1700s. One more thing I'd like to show you here. This is a cookie mold. You can see that you would take the dough and press it into this board. Do you see all the different shapes that it would make? Here's a star, a flower, and an owl. 
so you could make cookies in these shapes with this mold. Just one of many artifacts that you'll get to see if you come visit us here in the Blunt Mansion kitchen. Now besides the kitchen, there's one other building we can go inside that stands by itself here at Blunt Mansion. This is Governor Blunt's office. This is probably my favorite building and my favorite room and the whole place. Let me take you inside and show it to you. Inside Governor Blunt's office, Governor Blunt actually did the work of creating the state of Tennessee. He had to take a census. Do you know what a census is? It's when you count all the people who live in your territory. Blunt took a census, figured out that there were more than 70,000 people here, and that was enough people to make Tennessee a state. So we would no longer be the Southwest Territory, but could instead become the state of Tennessee. So in this room where I'm standing right now, some of the early leaders of our territory and state met and they wrote the first state constitution of Tennessee. When they finished it and they agreed that it was ready to go, they signed it on this desk. Now the desk was not originally in this room. It was in another building that was torn down a long time ago. But this is the actual desk that Tennessee's first constitution was signed on. So you could say that this is where Tennessee had its first birthday. This is ground zero for Tennessee history, this desk and we have it right here at Blunt Mansion and you can see it when you come visit us. One of the cool things about this desk, and I guess I should point out first of all that the man who used it, David Henley, would stand up when he worked because obviously you couldn't sit down in front of this desk and I think he was a pretty tall guy too. But when you lift this lid and you look inside, you can see these black spots. Here's one right here and another one right here where candles were left burning. So you walk up to the desk with your candle it's like your flashlight back then because there's no electric lights. You put the candle down, you reach for your papers, and you forget, and you shut the lid. And that's how we have these black spots. So these are stories. This furniture can tell us stories about things that happened more than 200 years ago. Here's another cool artifact in this room. This is a reproduction of the flag of the United States when Tennessee was admitted to the Union. Now, can you tell what's different about this flag from the flag that we use in the United States today? I'll give you just a second to look at it. You can see it's got red and white stripes, just like our flag today, and a blue field in the top corner with white stars. Most people start counting the stars and they say, hey, there are not 50 stars there. And that's right, because when this flag was created, there were not yet 50 states. So we have the stars in the corner, fewer stars, but the surprise in this flag that only a few people catch is the stripes. Let's count them together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So as you probably know now from school, the American flag today has 13 stripes for the original 13 colonies. In the early days of our country, they would add a stripe for every new state. So these are the 14th and 15th states. I've forgotten the 14th, but I know the 15th was Kentucky. When Tennessee came in as number 16, they looked at this and said, you know, we can't keep adding stripes or this flag is gonna get huge. So in the uh, mid 1800s, early 1800s, they dropped off these bottom two stripes, went back to 13 and just started adding stars. And that's how we got the flag that we have today. Let me show you one more thing over here in this room. Remember how I told you earlier that William Blunt signed the U.S. Constitution for North Carolina before he moved here and created Knoxville and started the state of Tennessee? Well, here in this corner of his office, we have a huge copy of the, pay, the signature page of the U.S. Constitution. And right here are the names of all the men who signed the U.S. Constitution, our founding fathers. And right here is William Blunt's signature with the other delegates from North Carolina. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this virtual field trip to Blunt Mansion. We've enjoyed having you here. Of course, there's no substitute for visiting Blunt Mansion in person, so I hope that when everything is open again and we're open to the public, that you'll come visit us either with your class or with your family. We'd be so glad to have you. Until then, stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you soon at Blunt Mansion.